It is so good to see you. Scripture says it's right for us to give praise to the Lord. We have so many reasons to thank the Lord and bless Him today. But the greatest reason of all is Jesus Christ, the firm foundation under our lives. Would you stand with us? And let's uh, open our service giving the Lord praise together. Christ the solid rock, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand, great is your faithfulness, great is your love, O oh God. And my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, great is your faithfulness, great is your love. Rock of ages, you will stand. Our foundation until the end, never failing, God unchanging. Rock of ages, you will stand. seems to hide your face. I rest on your unchanging grace. Great is your faithfulness, great is your love, O oh God. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Great is your faithfulness, great is your love, O oh God. Sing it out, Rock of Ages. Rock of ages, you will stand our foundation until the end, never failing, God unchanging, rock of You. It's good to see you. My name is Greg. If you don't know who, my, who I am, is my mic on? Is it working? Can you guys hear me? Yes, you can hear me? Hey, I have a projecting voice. It is so good to see you this morning. It's my privilege to welcome you this morning. If you're a guest of ours this morning, thank you for being here. I hope you have been warmly welcomed. Thank you to all of you who are online with us this morning. Same, if you're a guest this morning, let us know 
that you're here. Just put something in the chat this morning and let us know that you're with us this morning. There is a lot going on in the life of Anchor, and it's my privilege to to let you know about it, because any time that we get to serve together or be together, it is a good thing. And uh, I'm excited because tutoring starts in three days. And we have been talking about it. (laughs) You're clapping. That's good. That's good. We have been talking about it for months now because it's such a a core part of who we are as Anchor to be able to serve our community and serve the, the students and the families of the schools next door. And Three days from now, that's going down. And I would, I would bet, I haven't asked Allison this morning. She's going to shake her head, yay or nay. I would bet there's already a waiting list for students. She's laughing, so I'm going to take that as a yes. Um, and so there are plenty of opportunities for you still to say, hey, I'm willing to do that anytime from 4.30 to 6.30 on Wednesday nights. I'm willing to come help do a coloring sheet with a sibling of a, ch- of a student who's being served or welcome a family or serve a snack. There are roles outside of actually tutoring where you can participate. So let Allison know, let me know, let someone know. We'll get you to the right place if you're willing to serve in that area. Anytime this box shows up on stage, you know what time it is. <laughs> we are two months away from Christmas, and it is a, a privilege always to serve through Operation Christmas Child because we know that the gospel goes all around the world through these boxes. And so I want to thank Becky and Anna Yant and those who are participating and pulling this all together. It's all set up out in the commons area. And starting today, you can grab boxes and start the process of filling. And if you're like us, you procrastinate till the very end. And that's November 20th. That's the very end. All right. So don't wait. Don't wait till November. But go ahead and get your boxes today and start filling those up so that we can send the gospel all over the world. And when I talk about anticipation, if you haven't been around, um, you will, if you haven't been around, I just need to let you know, we called a new pastor to anchor a few weeks ago. And when I say anticipation, there's a lot of anticipation. When are they going to get here? And the answer is at the end of this month. That's three weeks away. And, uh, and Matt Tipton. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> sent us a video. And I want to share that with you right now. Good morning, anchor family. I don't know about you guys. But the Tipton crew is pumped about our first Sunday on October the 31st. We can't wait to get there and begin the work of unfolding God's kingdom in Gwinnett County with you. We're excited about building friendship and community with our new church family. But for now, the Tipton family, we're busy packing. As a matter of fact, this past week and this coming week, that's what we're, that's what we're busy doing. Uh, just take a look. Like We've got about two-thirds of our house already in boxes. Our plan is to finish packing up this coming week, and then we're going to hit the road for a little bit of a family vacation. We're actually looking forward to spending a couple of weeks together as a family processing our departure from Louisiana and preparing ourselves to begin, really begin again with you. And um, so I want to encourage you, please pray. Pray for a productive week of packing and for a restful week of vacation and a time of just renewal and connection for our family. You can also pray for me this morning. Right now, while you're in worship, I'm at Metairie Church preaching my very last sermon. Our church family here is actually hosting a celebration for us today to close out our ministry in New Orleans. We're really thankful for the ways the church has loved us here, especially especially over the last couple of weeks. You know, we, we exit New Orleans with really full hearts. Hearts thankful for all that God has done, but I need to tell you, Our hearts are also anticipating a great and glorious future with the Anchor family. A future dependent upon Christ and a future resolved to make disciples that make disciples in our neighborhoods and among the nations. Um, We already love you and uh, we can't wait to get started. So we're going to see you on the 31st. We're praying for you. Pray for us. We can't wait. So, all right, three weeks, and so we have a lot to be praying for for them and preparing, and we're going to be communicating as much as they're celebrating the end of something there. We're going to be celebrating the beginning of something here. So we'll be getting word out to you in the next few days on what that looks like and how we can uh, enjoy um, welcoming the Tipton family uh, into the Anchor family. I know it's going to be be a blessing. It's going to be an exciting time. So as we we prepare to continue our time of worship uh, through music and singing. Let's stand. Um, John's going to be preaching for us this morning. That's exciting. Welcome, Mr. Hadley. We're glad you're here. Welcome, Mr. Hadley. You know the the Hadleys. 
You guys know they're out in the, in the, in the various uh, senior living uh, facilities throughout um, our area serving in that capacity, and so it's hard for them to actually be here because they're always there, but we're thankful that, that you're here this morning. It's always a blessing to, to hear from John. So let's pray together as we, uh, as we continue. Father, it is our privilege to be here with you this morning. Father, thank you for your presence here. Thank you for your presence in our lives, the way that you pursue us, that you have a heart for us and that you love us. And over and over again, in spite of um, our uh, uh, sometimes disobedience or our, our rebellion or the, the times that we just simply are not in tune with your heart, Father, thank you that you continue to pour your grace out on us. Father, thank you for um, this time where we can be together as the body of Christ to fellowship with one another, to worship together, and to serve. Father, would you use this time to, to continue to grow us up in your likeness, to, to love you more, to love our community more, to serve so that the gospel and the kingdom might grow, so that we might grow into children who reflect your love and grace in our lives. Father, thank you for that. Father, we give you praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God will me here. Will be forever mine. My chains are gone. My chains are gone. My chains are gone. My chains are gone. 
was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. From the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time I had. For the blood applied, thank you, Jesus. It has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus. You have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Inside my tomb of sin, you were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb.
Let's pray together. Jesus, we have so many reasons to thank you and to praise you. Uh, you're faithful, you're kind, you're good. Uh, but Jesus, as we've been reminded through this song, uh, it's through your blood that we've been forgiven. It's through the fact that you laid down your life for us. And we're here today because of that, Jesus. We couldn't be here without you. And we thank you for the ways you've shown grace to us in our lives, Lord, to help us to understand our need for you and then the grace to call out to you for salvation. Jesus, thank you that your blood brings full and complete forgiveness from all of our sin. And we, we take great hope and joy and peace and rest in that today. And no matter what else is going on in life, Jesus, we have that as a solid foundation under us that because of you, we're completely and fully forgiven and we become sons and daughters and we become your brothers and sisters. And that is not because of us, Jesus. That's because of you. So thank you for that. Lord, strengthen us through your word. Thank you for John. Lord, lead him. Um, fill his mouth with your words, Lord, and give us hearts and ears that are receptive to your voice today. We pray all of this humbly, thankfully, joyfully in the name of our Savior, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. John, come and lead us in God's Word. It's good to be here with you today. Uh, I, uh, I'm not trying to set, set a new dress standard or anything like that. <laughs> Uh, but when I went to uh, Bible college and seminary, they required us to wear a jacket or a sweater and tie to every class that we went to. If it, they found us on campus without a jacket, uh, we were penalized. And uh, I've managed to get rid of the tie, that, that much of it. Uh, but I, I quite frankly... Uh, a few weeks ago, we had the opportunity to go back up to Pennsylvania where we pastored back in the 70s. We went there in 1970, and the church was experiencing its 150th anniversary at that time. And uh, we never thought we'd be around for their 200th. But they, uh, it, that came up last year, of course, and last year the pandemic uh, postponed it. So this year they celebrated the 200th anniversary and we went up there for it so that we could be involved with it again. And uh, uh, Saturday night was the night for the former pastors to uh, have a, about a 10 minute time. And uh, I went there and uh, dressed as I was when I was traveling. And I felt naked. I really did. <laughs> so, and not only that, but every Sunday, uh, we're speaking to uh, people who are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, every week. And they kind of expect the pastor to wear a jacket. And so we do that every, every Sunday. I'd like to call your attention today to a passage of Scripture that really came to me as soon as Matt had s said that he would like me to come this week. Uh, there was this, uh, this passage of Scripture that came to my mind, and the, the thought behind it uh, became pretty prevalent in my thoughts throughout the week. It's Acts chapter 13. If you have your Bible or your phone or your iPad <laughs> here with you today. By the way, uh, I have been preaching from an iPad now for the past nine years, I think, something like that. Uh, that's the one advancement that I've made in, in this matter of preaching is that I like to use my iPad. It allows me to put my 
uh, my scripture verses right into my notes, and I don't have to memorize them. And at my age, memory is not the greatest thing in the world. That now, uh, it's Acts chapter 13, just the first four verses. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Now, the question is, who did the Holy Spirit speak to at this particular point? And obviously it was the elders of the church. He said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. If I'm going to give a title to this message, I would call it the Divine Human Cooperative. This is a principle that uh, is found in the Word of God, and I don't believe there is any more confounding principle in the Word of God than this one. God chose to use human beings to carry out his purposes. When you stop and think about that, that's, that almost seems like a bad decision, you know? <laughs> Uh, uh, now, God doesn't make bad decisions, but it, it sort of sounds like it. Uh, in its most basic statement, it is that God allows men to work with him and on his behalf to accomplish his will. And we see it here in this passage most clearly stated. They, that is, the elders of the church at Antioch, sent them away. But he's, we're told clearly that they were sent by the Holy Spirit. So there's a cooperation going on here between the Holy Spirit and the elders of the church. And later on, that cooperation is seen in the Apostle Paul and Barnabas and all that are in, involved in this. This principle is demonstrated very clearly in this. When God set out to reach the Gentile world, he chose two people to start the process. He chose Paul and Barnabas to begin the work. And these two men started a chain of events that is continuing right up until this day. And it will continue until the Lord calls us home. We call it missions. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the most important work anyone could ever hope to be involved in. It's been a deep part of our ministry over the years. I'll never forget the, uh, the first Bible conference we had at school when I was first started school. Uh, Juanice and I had been married for a number of years. Kathy was three years old when, when uh, I started Bible school. I left Juanice in Flint. She was working for the police department at that time. And I went off to Grand Rapids to, to begin my schooling. And the first week or so of school, we had a, a, a Bible conference, actually a missions conference. And God began to work in my heart. And on Monday, I felt this horrible, horrible feeling that God was calling me into missions. And uh, <laughs> I was the monitor of the boys' dorm, so I went back to the dorm and prayed about it, managed to push it off. This went on from Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, about Thursday, the Lord finally got through to me. And I remember going into a little closet we had. We called it the prayer closet, but it was just a little closet where we had a chair and a light. <laughs> we, I went in, got down on my knees. Hadn't had a chance to talk to one East about it at all. But I got down on my knees. And I swallowed and said, Lord, if you want me to be a missionary, I'll be a missionary. And then the Lord said, okay, that's all I want to hear. Now you go out and be a pastor with a missionary heart. Be a pastor who has a concern for missions. A pastor who's willing to give part of your budget to missions. A pastor who's concerned about missions. 
You see, it's interesting. God has chosen to use people to carry out his plan. Now, he could have, he could have chosen another method to do this. Actually, Hollywood has shown us how he could have done it. Uh, Hollywood, you remember in It's a Wonderful Life? How did Hollywood say that God was going to correct this thing? They said Clarence. You remember Clarence? The angel? <laughs> you know, God has legions of angels at his disposal. And they are not like human beings. They're not like I was. They don't have any qualms about serving God. If God wants them to do something, they just do it, you know? And there's no question about it. He could have, uh, he could have sent uh, angels out like Touched by an Angel or Highway to Heaven, you know, all those old programs that Hollywood put out for us. But he didn't choose that. He chose to use human beings. And, and then uh, in, in his choice, he, he takes these, these people and he gives them certain gifts. Uh, Barnabas was, was, you know, he was called Barnabas because of, of the personality that he had. Uh, Barnabas wasn't his given name. That was his nickname. You know? uh, we, we see this uh, a little later. Uh, he, he, he talks about the fact that, that uh, Barnabas was called the son of consolation. That was, uh, that's what the word Barnabas means. Barnabas had a personality that was more like a, like a psychologist or a counselor, someone who was sympathetic to people, who was just, he really related to people. And Barnabas also had, had another gift, another spiritual gift. It was the gift of giving. You remember that when the early church started? Uh, Barnabas, uh, Joseph actually is his, was his given name, uh, when uh, he went out and sold land and brought it and gave it to the apostles and said, here, use this for the church, meet the needs that are there. Uh, and and uh, so Barnabas, Barnabas had special gifts that were given to him. And, and everything started out with Barnabas. Uh, Saul was sort of a tack-on to this team. He was the second choice. But Paul, he was an energetic goal-oriented overachiever <laughs> who wouldn't slow down for a moment. And you got these two kind of opposite guys going out there to become the first two missionaries that, that were going out to, to reach, basically to reach the Gentiles, to cross over from Jews to Gentiles. Each had spiritual gifts that God gave them. Paul had the gift of apostleship. Ephesians 4 says, and he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastor teachers. Barnabas had the gift of exhortation. That is the gift of counseling and the gift of giving. By the way, I hope you realize that God has given you spiritual gifts as well. And, and there's a reason for that because you're part of this whole divine human cooperative. You're just as much a part of it as the Apostle Paul was, maybe with a little different task to perform. God placed himself in dependence upon the will of men and women in history to see his will accomplished. Think of that. Isn't that a mar marvelous thing when you think about it? And, and it isn't, isn't it, isn't it something to revel in that God would be willing to use someone like us to do his will? We see this principle in church history. It started off with Paul and Barnabas. Uh, these two were human. And, and, and it wasn't very long before they revealed their humanity in this whole thing. They showed how frail they were and they showed how how much they they needed the control of God because after their first journey and they're getting ready to start their second journey you remember what happened <laughs> John Mark had gone with them in the beginning and and he kind of slipped out and decided to go home in the middle of the trip and uh, he was the nephew of Barnabas 
And Barnabas decided he wanted to take John Mark with him on the second journey. And Paul said, no way. This guy, we don't want anybody who's a quitter. And they argued about it. And they couldn't come to a conclusion. They couldn't resolve the matter. So what did they do? They divided. They split like a church. You know? They split. And Barnabas took Mark, and he went one direction. And Paul took Silas, and he went another direction. And their flaws and differences resulted in doubling the missionary force. And it's something God used it that way. Instead of one team, there were two because they were human and they couldn't get along. Let's, let's jump ahead. 1,800 years. 1,800 years now. We're past the Reformation time and all of this. And there's a man over in England by the name of William Carey. He's a shoemaker. And God begins to burden his heart for the people of India. England at that time had established a trade route to India, and there were, there were organizations that were involved there, and England and India were going to be vitally connected. In 1793, he came to the leaders of his denomination. They were called Particular Baptists. Most Baptists are particular. <laughs> uh, and and uh, John Ryland, who was the leader of the group at that time, he said, young man, sit down. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without your aid or mine. Yeah. That's the kind of support he got from his churches. Against all kinds of opposition, he persisted. And by the time Carey died, he had been in India for 41 years without a furlough. His mission could count just a few people saved. Actually, of all the, the time he was there, there were only about 700 East Indians that came to know the Lord. But he had laid an impressive foundation of Bible translation. He translated the Bible into six different languages while he was there. And not only that, he had scripture portions translated into 29 different languages languages while he was there. It cost him. He lost his wife and his son to death, then a second wife, then a third. And he earned the title, the father of modern missions. William Carey. Hope you remember that name. Significant person. Uh, but you know, God didn't just do this with men. He touched women, too. <laughs> Some years ago, Juanice and I had the privilege of going to Mexico. We were invited to, by Baptist Midmissions to come down and speak to their spring conference. And um, the, the missionary that was involved in, in uh, inviting us uh, was a, a dear lady. She was a single missionary. Uh, she and her partner uh, shared a, a, a home together down there, but they were, they were just, uh, uh, I guess, the closest thing to, to men missionaries that a woman could become. <laughs> you know, she was pretty tough. And uh, they had a, quite a ministry uh, down there, and they tra traveled all over Mexico and showed us all around. So there are women involved in missions, and God, God uses them all the time. There was a lady by the name of Gladys Aylward. Some of you may remember this, this missionary. She was a British missionary. She was born in 1902. She died in 1970, so she was only 68 years old when she passed away. But her story was written in a book called The Small Woman, starring Ingrid Bergman in the movie. <laughs> And they made that movie in 1958. She served in China during the 30s and the 40s. And when the Japanese invaded the region where she was, she led 100, over 100 orphans to safety across the mountains of China and away from the Japanese. When she wasn't allowed to go back into China after World War II, she went to Taiwan, where many of the 
Chinese nationalists had gone. And she established an orphanage there, and she died in 1970, having served the Lord faithfully in China and Taiwan. Well, I could go on for a long time, but there's, there's a, a name I'm sure that probably none of you have ever heard before. It's a man by the name of Viggo Olson. Viggo Olson was a medical doctor. He was a surgeon. And God called this man to start a hospital in what was then called East Pakistan. It's now called Bangladesh because it was part of Pakistan at that time. He was called to start a hospital and today the Memorial Christian Hospital stands as a tribute to his vision and his work. He became so involved in the government of, of East Pakistan, later Bangladesh, that when it became Bangladesh, he was granted visa number one and uh, is still looked upon as a true statesman there. Um, he, uh, he led the prince of a Chakma tribe to the Lord. And you say, one person? That's all? Yeah, one person. But as a result of that prince coming to know the Lord, that tribe became a dominant Christian influence in the area of, of Bangladesh and across the border into Burma or Myanmar. And as a result of that, there's a revival going on in Myanmar today, it's still going on. People are still coming to know the Lord in spite of the opposition, in spite of the persecution that's going on in Myanmar, one of the most persecuted countries in the world, and people are coming to know the Lord right and left because of this man who touched the prince of a tribe that followed the prince into the kingdom of God and then shared the gospel with their neighbors. Think of that. And of course, I'd be remiss if I did not even mention the name of Billy Graham, <laughs> you know, a young man who just called to be a preacher and called to be an evangelist. And, and, and uh, he, he would be the first one to tell you that this didn't happen because he was such a great preacher. It happened because God work circumstances in his life in such a way that he became known nationwide because of an unsaved man who owned a newspaper chain and thought that what Billy Graham was doing was going to be helpful to the country. And so he told his newspaper people, you publicize this man, put him out front, make people understand who this is. And, and, and that's what happened. The Hearst papers began to publicize Billy Graham. And as a result of that, Billy Graham touched the whole nation. Not only the nation, he touched most of the world with the gospel. Well, you say, well, I could never do anything like that. <laughs> well, I understand. I understand. See, the, the principle goes on. When God wants to perform a work, he will generally lay it upon the heart of a man or a woman and see that it's carried out through them. Doesn't do it, they don't do it alone. God is always involved in, in helping them. We see it in the call of the 12 apostles and the life of the early church. We don't know much about the other apostles besides Peter and Paul, but we do know from from tradition at least, that each of them went into different areas and they began to preach the gospel and such, and they touched people's lives. We saw it in the life of Paul, who crossed the barrier from Jews to Gentiles and brought the gospel to Europe, and aren't you glad? Because if it wasn't in Europe, we, would, we wouldn't have it here. And the life of Billy Graham, who set out to win souls and touched a whole nation, and perhaps most of the world, and a fellow by the name of Steve Hammock <laughs> had a vision for a church in Grayson. And here we are, you know. Just think of that. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's just that way, 24 years ago, and here we are. Uh, I, I've named some famous people, and I've named some people who were not so famous. But we can't forget that for every famous person, there are hundreds, indeed 
there are thousands of faithful servants of God who will remain anonymous until we stand before God. Maybe even then, we won't know too much about them. It was about 68 years ago that God spoke to me about serving him. Now, I don't mind telling you, I'm, I'm probably the most reluctant servant that God has ever had. Every time he has tried to, to direct me in this, I have argued with him. I was 19 years old at the time, and I was studying at General Motors Institute to become an engineer for General Motors. And when the Lord said, I was sitting at the back of a church at an ordination council. Uh, the Lord had called a young man from our church uh, to go into the ministry. The first one that I can recall for years and years, we hadn't seen anybody from our church go into the ministry, but here was this young man. His name was Ronnie Globig. And uh, he was standing in the front of the church. I'd never been to an ordination council before and in, the, uh, in that area and among those churches. The general pattern was to invite pastors from the area to come in and, and interview this person, ask him questions, and make sure that he knew what he was talking about, that he was really called to go into the ministry, and really put him on the spot. And they did, for probably two or three hours sitting there uh, talking with this man. He was up front listening to the questions and answering the questions, and I'm sitting back there and admiring him very, very much. And the Lord, it wasn't an audible voice. It might as well have been because it was just as clear. The Lord said to me, this is what I want for you. And I said, no, Lord, you don't want me. You see, I knew me. <laughs> I, I, I knew, I, I was not a spiritual person. I mean, I had come to know the Lord when I was 15, and I, this is about four years later, and, and I went to the church, and we were involved in the youth group, and I sang in the choir and all that sort of stuff. I was, I was sort of like everybody else in the church, but I knew that I wasn't a spiritual person. So I said no to the Lord. It took him four years to get me into Bible college. Now, 16 years later, I was preaching in Pennsylvania on a Sunday morning. Two young boys came down the aisle after the message to accept the Lord Jesus as their Savior. One of them was 13, and the other one was 16. They were brothers. And when the service was over, I asked one of our deacons to take the 16-year-old, and I took the 13-year-old. We went into one of the Sunday school classrooms, and we sat down and talked. And I shared the gospel uh, with this 13-year-old boy, and uh, he accepted the Lord. Today, that boy is pastoring a church in Pittsburgh. He's been with that church for 30-some years. He started it with about 15 or 20 people. Today, they're in the process of building a $13 million church building for the church. And he has a vision. We talked about it while, while we were up there for the 200th anniversary. He came and shared it with me. He has a vision to establish 50 satellite churches <laughs> in the city of Pittsburgh. And, 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 and that's not his goal. It's, it's not just to establish the 50 satellite churches. What his thought is that if he establishes 50 satellite churches for his church all across the city of Pittsburgh, he's going to affect the whole way in which the city thinks and how it votes <laughs> and all that. Well, we never know what God can do when we finally say yes to the Lord. Uh, I got a call 26 years ago when we were back at, in Pennsylvania for the 175th anniversary. Got a call from a young woman. She had been one of our young people in the, in the youth group at the church. And she, and she asked me the question, she says, do you know how many young people went into Christian service from our youth group? I said, no, I have no idea. 
She said, 18. And I've been thinking about it this week. What do you suppose those young people who are now in their 50s and their 60s, what do you suppose they're going to accomplish for the Lord? You see, we, we don't have to do it all. That's not the point. We don't, we don't do it all. God calls us to do something. He may call us to talk to a neighbor and just share the gospel with a neighbor. Maybe he'll call for us to change the direction of our life and uh, maybe study for the ministry and, and go into it full time. Maybe not. More, more often than not, they can't all be... You know, when you, when you think about it, there are more Indians than there are chiefs, you know. And, and, and so there are going to be more laymen than there are clergy. And so if the Lord speaks to you, the chances are he's going to use you in some capacity where you have gifts and you have abilities that probably only you can do. And you may touch people that nobody else in the world can touch because they're close to you and they respect you and all of this. We'll never know, I don't think, until we get to heaven. There is throughout Scripture a divine human cooperative. God works through people to accomplish his will and it's more than a gracious of God to include us. He could have done it himself. Could have just spoken the word. It would have been done. He could have sent his angels. You know. But he didn't. And it's important, I think, for us to understand that he doesn't have any other plan. This is it. If this doesn't work, then nothing's going to work. For some, it may be the influence of a word to a neighbor or friend. For another, it may be a vision of a great movement like William Carey or, or Viggo Olson. For some, the work that we accomplish for God may just simply be that we've obeyed God when he told us to do something for him. And his will was accomplished. And the final effect may not be realized until we get to glory. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, you know the needs that we have in our life. You know what it is you want to accomplish in our lives. We all have goals. We, we, we set the goals to, to meet our desires and the things that seem important to us, but Father, the things that may, be, may seem to be important to us may not be the things that are important to you. So, Father, we pray that you would speak to us today. I remember when you said, this is what I want for you. And I argued, but Father, thank you. Thank you for being persistent. Thank you for not letting me say no. Father, I pray for this congregation, for every person that's sitting here in the audience today. You know their hearts, you know their lives and their minds. You know what it is that you want to accomplish in their life. And you know, Father, that there is no more satisfying life than to be obedient to you. Thank you, Father. Now please keep your heads bowed. We don't normally have an invitation in this church <laughs> at the close of the service. But I remember the days when we did. I wonder 
this morning. Just where you're sitting, are there any of you that perhaps God has spoken to today that maybe, maybe he said something like, I want you. If, if that's the case, would you just stand where you are? Nobody's looking around except me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God has spoken to you. And you know you need to say yes. Don't know what it is he wants, necessarily. He'll tell you when the time comes. Like Abraham, you know, leave her of the Chaldees and I'll tell you where to go. <laughs> That's the way it works. Okay, thank you so much. You can be seated, please. Father, we pray for this decision, these decisions. You know the hearts, and you know the needs that are there. We commit them to thee, Father. We ask that you would use them to the fullest. And we'll give you the praise for what you accomplish. In Jesus' name. Thank you, John. The Lord's grace, gracious to use us, and uh, we're going to sing a song that actually gives us hope to know that the Lord is with us in Christ alone. If it weren't for Jesus in us, it would be a fearful future <laughs> to think that the Lord calls us to serve and follow and obey him uh, without his power in us. But because of Christ, we have hope, uh, a hope that doesn't disappoint, a hope that never runs out, and we stand in Christ alone today. Amen? Stand with us and let's make this our song of response to the Lord. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. Those who come flesh, fullness of God in hell, this babe, this gift of love and a righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on the cross that Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was.
John, thank you again. Thank you so much for leading us in God's word. Thank you for your faithful ministry and just the ways you encourage us. Whenever you speak, you always encourage us in very uh, special ways. So thank you for that. Uh, it's been great to be together today. We're not quite done. We actually have a baptism. So I'm going to invite all of us over to the other building in just a second to have baptism. Um, we're going to go as a family because this is a work the Lord has done in Trey Wright to make him his own. And so we're going to celebrate with Trey. And in just a second, I'll pray to dismiss us. Those of you who've been watching online today, we're so thankful for you. And we pray the Lord has blessed you as you've worshiped right from where you are. And uh, so let me pray to dismiss us. And then we're going to head out. Kim, you have something? Okay. Um, let me let me pray. And then do you need to say something, Kim? Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Kim. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. He has abundant provision. Let's, uh, let's pray. We'll thank him for that. Also, thank him for, for being, leading us today, and then we'll head over for baptism. So join me as we pray. Father, we thank you for your faithful presence in our lives. And Lord, just as we've heard uh, your work in Philip and Kim's life and in their circumstances, God, we praise you for the way you met that need. It was an overwhelming need, God, and you met it with overwhelming grace, and we thank you for that. Lord, thank you for uh, just the ways you, you see us through very hard situations but, Lord, you're also faithful in very small things in a day-in and day-out way. We praise you for that, God, because without you, without your sustaining work and grace in our lives, Lord, uh, we wouldn't have hope. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for, for your grace in big things and in small things. Lord, we thank you for your uh, leading today and for being with us as we've worshiped. And so, Lord, now as we go, we, we want to go, Lord, in your name, and we want to bear your name well and honorably in all that we say and do, Lord. So give us grace for that as we... Uh, as we make our way through this week. And Lord, we pray all of this in the powerful and the good name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's join together over in the other building. Thank you for joining us today and allowing us into your home and life. Maybe something touched your heart or there's something going on in your life that we can pray about. Or perhaps this might be the most important day of your life and you made a decision to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Whatever it is or wherever you are in your spiritual walk, we would love to pray for you. And you can send those prayer requests to us at prayerline at anchorholds.org. And we'll connect with you and meet you right where you are. We hope today has been a blessing to you and that you'll make the decision to join us again next week. We look forward to seeing you then. Mm -hmm.